Hi everyone, welcome back to the US CPA classes. In this particular class, I'll be walking you through in detail about prospective analysis, including the use of data, and more specifically, we'll be covering the topic cost of equity calculation and all the method of cost of equity calculation. So let's understand more in detail about cost of equity and how to calculate and what all methods are being available. So let's dive into for more detail. Hi everyone, welcome to the BAR classes. So in the last class, we have started with capital structure, if you remember, right? And I have shared the notes as well with you. So quickly, uh, I'll reiterate what we have studied in uh, last class because, you know, there's a gap of a week. So it's good quickly reiterate and then we'll move on to the next topic 2.2.3. So in capital structure, we discuss like what is capital structure, like mix of debt, preference share, equity, and all those things. Then we discuss about the risk, both business risk as well as operational risk. And then we discuss about the leverages. In the leverage, we discuss in detail about what is operating leverage, what is finance leverage. Now, I think today, yeah, today we need to start with this capital structure, including weighted average cost of capital and then financial structure, which is like capital structure plus non-interest bearing liability. So maybe just take a look at the notes if you have any doubt before we jump onto the topic of weighted average cost of capital. So risk we have covered. Hope this is all clear to all of you. And then we discuss about category of risk, uh, which include like interest rate risk, reinvestment risk, liquidity risk, market risk, company risk, and credit risk. Then we discuss about leverage, both the leverages, operating leverage, financial leverage, and it resulted to the total leverage. And then we did some illustration also for this leverage. And uh, yeah, so this illustration we have done. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yeah, Kashish? Yes, sir. Yeah, because uh, maybe like sometime my Hotel internet lag. So if you feel at yeah, any point of clear. time like uh, my, I'm not clear, just let me know. I can stop my video and then maybe we can continue. Right. Okay. Then after we we had some practical question. So this is what we have done in the last class. So today we'll be starting with the capital structure. So capital structure include all the amount which you receive in a capital nature for the investment in your organization. So that can be your short-term debt, that can be your long-term debt, that can be your preferred stock, that can be equity or any retained earning which you have from the current year profit or the earlier profits. So those all things combined together will result into a capital structure. And the financial structure is capital structure Plus, if there is any non-interest bearing liability, like accrued, accrued expenses, accrued uh, liabilities, or those all things come under, in addition to the capital structure will result into financial structure. So third and fourth topic of 2.2.2, uh, we'll be covering it together, right? So here in capital structure, we'll be discussing about weighted average cost of capital. So if you guys studied uh, maybe in your college days or any other professional education, anything about weighted average cost of capital? And why do we calculate weighted average cost of capital? Any idea? Hello, sir. Yes, Matthew. Uh, uh, last week, com we completed these topics, right? Yes. Yeah. So oh, we have already oh. completed, sir. Okay, 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 okay. Got it. Okay, sorry, my bad. So it's a gap of a week. Till uh, let me know till which topic we have covered. Till here we have covered. Have we covered the leases also? But you can stop the video, I guess. Have we covered the leases also? Hmm? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, my bad. Yes, sir, covered. And we have we covered equity financing as well. Okay, so I think uh, this this also we completed. This also we have covered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and this one? Yeah, from yeah, from this I think. From uh, here. Okay. Okay. Cool. We so completed we are... that. Uh, I think uh, that uh for advantages and disadvantages. No advantage and disadvantage of what? Kashish? Uh, yeah, Kashish? So, uh, uh, let me try with this Audible now? Yes, it's fine. Hmm. So have we covered this one? Cost of equity calculation? No, sir. This one no. This one we have not covered. So we have covered till here, you're saying? Till retain earning? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Sorry about yes. that. Yeah. Yes. So cost of equity calculation method. So there are two methods. One is dividend growth model and the second one is capital asset pricing model. So these are the two models for calculation of cost of equity. So why do we need to calculate cost of equity? Any idea? To optimize the overall capital structure, we need to understand how much is the cost we are paying for debt, how much is the cost we are paying for preferential and how much is the cost of equity so that you can have appropriate percentage of equity preference and debt in your capital structure to minimize your overall cost of capital and maximize the return on investment. So that is the whole objective of identifying the cost of equity, right? So there are two methods to calculate the cost of equity. The first one is dividend growth model. So as the name suggests, dividend growth model, that means as the dividend is growing year over year, so whatever is the future dividend you are expecting, the present value of the dividend would be considered as the value of equity. So cost of equity is the present value of the future inflow, future cash inflow, you are expecting to be received in the form of dividend, right? The formula is KE stands for cost of equity. D1 stands for future dividend per share. P0 stands for stock price at the current date. And F stands for floating cost. And the G stands for dividend growth at the constant rate. So the formula is KE is equal to D1 divided by P0 bracket 1 minus F plus G, that is growth, right? So this formula you need to memorize. So that's, a, you know, there are a few formulas like ratio analysis and a couple of other formulas. Those formulas you need to memorize. Same way here also for a dividend growth model. So this formula is something you need to memorize, but conceptually, the dividend growth model says, so whatever the expected dividend in the future period, the present value of the same 
would be considered as cost of equity under the dividend growth model. So if you see this paragraph, the dividend growth or discount model is a method of valuing the price of the company stock based on the fact that its stock is worth the sum of all future dividend payment discounted back to their present value. That means how do you calculate the value of share based on the future dividend you are expecting multiply by the present value factor of that. Right. So here is an example to do the mathematical calculation. For example, current dividend is dollar one point five per share, and you are expected year over year growth will be six percent per annum. New stock price is expected to be thirty dollar per share, and floating cost is ten percentage of the stock price. Right. So what will be the firm cost of equity as per the dividend growth model? So what all information is provided to you? Current dividend is how much? 1.5. Right. Expected growth, 6 percentage. Right. And stock price is expected $30. And the floating cost is 10. So what is the formula? D1, what is D1? Future dividend per share. That is 1.5 multiplied by 1.06. Right? Clear? The future dividend is 6% higher than the current dividend. Right, everyone? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Huh? So, and then divide by P0. What is P0 here? $30, which is expected stock price. Right, bracket 1 minus F. F is 10%, right? That is 1 minus 0 .0, 0 0.10, right? And then lastly, you will be adding G, which is a growth rate. That is 6%, right? So if you do the bath, you will see 1.59, which is 1.50 multiplied by 1.06, divide by 27. How do you calculate 27? $30 multiplied by 0 0.90. That is 27, right? Plus 6%. So it will give you 5.89% plus 6%, which is a growth year over year. So cost of equity here is 11.89%. Right? Any doubt here? No, so far, so good? Yes. Yeah, so this is about dividend growth model. How do you calculate the cost of equity when you are using dividend growth model, right? And what is the objective of dividend growth model? So you'll be using dividend growth model based on the future expected dividend value at the present rate, right? So present value of the future expected dividends that is called dividend growth model to calculate the cost of equity. Second is, in the right hand side, if you see, the model is called CAPM. The full form is Capital Asset Pricing Model. Hmm? So Capital Asset Pricing Model, the formula is RI, which is Capital Asset Expected Return, RF, which is Risk-Free Rate of Return, BI is a sensitivity factor rm is the expected return of the market and then risk free rate of return minus rm is equal to market rate premium so what is the market rate premium market rate premium is the market rate of interest minus the risk free rate of interest right so the formula is ri is equal to RF plus BI multiplied by RM minus RF. So RM is what? Expected rate of return of market minus RF is equal to risk-free rate of interest. So the difference will result into market rate premium. Right? The CAPM is widely used throughout the finance for pricing risk security and generating the expected return on the assets 
given the risk of those assets and cost of capital, right? So most of the time you will see the CAPM method has been used. So you need to remember this formula. So this formula is very important. Just note it down or mark somewhere in your notes. Like this, both of these formula are very important and it's 100% sure you will get at least one question on these two dividend growth model or CAPM model in your examination, right? So the CAPM describes the relationship between systematic risk and expected rate of return on asset, right? So how do you do the calculation? So there's an example to it, T bill rate, that means treasury bill rate. So treasury bill rate is generally considered as risk-free rate. So risk-free rate, if you say in India, the amount, you know, the interest rate which you receive on fixed deposit, right? Fixed deposit is almost risk-free, right? Okay. Or any government bonds, right? So same way in US, it is called treasury bill. So any interest rate on treasury bill is generally considered as risk-free rate of return. Second, they have given information is a market risk premium. So what is market risk premium which you have studied above? Market rate of return minus the risk-free rate of return, right? That means market rate of return is risk premium plus risk-free rate, 7% plus 3.5%. That is 3.35%. That is 10.35% is the market rate of return. And the BI they have given, which is sensitivity factor is 1.4. That means if there is 1% change in any factor, it results into 1.4% change in the cost of this respective asset. Right? So BI is basically sensitivity factor based on one decimal change or based on one percentage change in market, how much percentage value of your share or your security increase or decrease. So that is called sensitivity factor. So what return would investor require to hold the security as per CAPM method, right? So in the CAPM method, the formula is RI is equal to RF plus BI multiplied by RM minus RF, right? So RI you need to calculate. What is RF they have given you? 3.5%, right? Risk-free rate of return is how much? 3.35. 3.35%, right? And then BI is 1.4, right? Multiply by the market rate premium they have already given you. That means RM minus RF, they have already given you 7%, right? So 7% multiply by 1.4 times plus 3.35 is equal to 13.15, right? Any doubt how we need to do the calculation in math? Uh, risk premium. Mm -hmm. So risk... Method. No, uh, risk free rate, rate uh, market rate premium. RM minus RF is market rate premium. Okay. This one. Right. In the formula, this RM minus RF. If they are separately given you the expected market rate of return or risk free rate of return, then you can do individual math. Or if they have given you already RM minus RF, that is market rate premium, then you can take that directly. Got it. Yeah. Right? Yes, yeah, hmm. So this is about dividend growth model and CAPM model. So weighted average cost of capital. So there's a formula to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Like we were discussing earlier, in the capital, it includes debt, preference share, and equity. Right? So first you need to calculate what is the weight of debt you have, what is the weight of preference share you have, and what is the weight of equity you have. For example, if you have $1 million in the capital structure, right? out of that $1 million, let's assume you have $600,000 equity 
you have three hundred thousand dollar debt and you have two hundred thousand dollar preference share. That means how much is the weight of equity in your capital structure? Sixty thousand uh six hundred thousand dollar divide by one million dollar that is sixty percent. Make sense? Are you guys with me? Yes, I am saying if your total capital structure is $1 million, out of that $1 million, $600,000 are related to equity, $300,000 related to preferential, sorry, the, uh, debt, and $200,000 related to preferential. Right? So, what is the weight of equity? $600,000 divided by one million that is sixty percent, right? Yes, sir. And what is the weight of debt? Three hundred thousand dollar divided by one million, thirty percent. Yes, sir. Right. And what is the percentage of preference here? Ten percent. Two hundred twenty percent. Right. Clear. Everyone. Right. So first thing is identification of the weight of debt, preferential, and equity. Second thing is multiplication of cost of debt with the weight of debt, cost of preferential with the weight of preferential, and the cost of equity with the weight of equity. Right. This is what the formula is mentioned here. Weighted average cost of capital. Weight of debt multiplied by cost of debt plus weight of preferential multiplied by cost of preferential, weight of equity multiplied by cost of equity. So the total sum of all the three will give you weighted average cost of capital. Right? Clear this formula? Yeah, Arun. Ashish, Manish. Yes, sir. So, let's do an example. In the example, they have given you interest on debt is 5%. Marginal tax rate is 40%. Per value of preferred stock is $1,000. Preferred dividend is 4%. Required rate of return on equity that means cost of equity is 16 percent capital structure include 30 percent debt 10 percent preferred stock and 60 percent equity so what is the weighted average cost of capital so what we need to calculate first the weight of debt multiplied by the cost of debt so how do we calculate cost of debt interest on debt is being allowable expense yes or no yes sir and what is the tax rate they have given to you 40 percent right so what is the cost of debt five percent multiplied by one minus 40 percent right what is the cost of debt Sir, KD one minus T thana. So, sir, cost of debt hmm. one minus tax rate that is one yes. point, one minus one. How much is it? Can you do the math for me? How do you calculate cost of debt? Please do the math for me. Hmm? Yeah, Arun, Manish. Matthew, cost of debt is 5% multiplied by 1 minus tax rate. How much is the tax rate? 40%? Yes, sir. 60% so of 5%. How much is it? 3%? Right? Cost of debt is? KD is yeah. cost of debt, right? That uh -huh. is yeah sorry cost of debt will be how much
five percent multiply by one minus point six. How much is it? Three percent. So one minus point four over now. Uh huh. That is point six. So five into point six. That is three percent. Right. So KD mm -hmm. is how much? Three yes. percent. Right. And what is the weight of debt? Ten percent. Uh, they have given thirty percent. That is thirty yes. percent. Right. Thirty percent multiply by three percent. How much is it? Ninety. Ninety sir. Hmm. Point zero zero nine. Yes sir. Right. Nine percent. Hmm. Second is your preferred stock. Preferred dividend is four percent. Mm -hmm. And the preferred stock is 10%, right? So 10% multiplied by 4% is how much? 0 0.004, yes, sir. right? And what is the cost of equity? 16% multiplied by the 60. How much is it? 9.96. Hmm. 0.96, right? So 0 0.009. Plus zero zero four plus zero zero nine six is equal to zero point one zero nine. That is ten point nine percent. Make sense? Yes, sir. Clear cut Arun. Hmm. Arun, Harini, Manish, Swapnil, clear. Yes, sir. Sir, only hmm. we have to calculate the cost of debt, right? Baki to sir directly here. Yes, because debt are debt interest are tax allowed, right? So as you are getting tax benefit, so you need to reduce the cost. Right? Next is key element in making capital structure decision. So first one is sales stability. So when you are making capital structure decision. For any organization, what all things you should be keeping in mind? The first one is sales stability. A firm whose sales are stable can take on more debt than the firm whose sales are unstable. So if your sales year over year is growing or it's more and more stable, then you would be in a better position to take more and more loans without heavy cost of debt. Right? Make sense? Yes, sir. Dear. Second is asset structure. The firm with the assets that are suitable to be pledged as security for the loan can use more debt heavily than the firm with the special purpose asset. For example, there is one company which is heavy capital intensive organization. Let's assume manufacturing of car. Right, so there would be a land, there would be building, there would be plant machinery, right? And against that, you can take a secured loan, right? On the other hand, there is a tech company, like for example, like Baiju, right? Any such company which may not have that much big or heavy asset for them, they might need to take unsecured loan, right? Because they do not have property to give on lien. So the unsecured loan may be generally at higher interest rate compared to the secured loan. Make sense? Yes. yes. Right? Yes. So the asset structure also may depend on the cost of debt. Third is operating leverage. The firm with less operating leverage are better able to employ financial leverage. So what is operating leverage? Hope you remember. The leverage between sales to gross profit, right? So, the, if you have better operating leverage, that means if you have good margins in the gross margin, then you can take more and more financial leverage because you are in a capacity to pay interest, right? The firm with less operating leverage are better able to employ financial leverage. Fourth is growth rate. So if you remember, we have discussed 
this model dividend growth rate, right? That is very much dependent on how much the dividend you are expecting to grow year over year, right? So growth rate, that is faster growing company are more likely to rely more heavily on debt. The company who are growing faster, they take more and more debt for the infusion of capital into their organization and they create more and more value for the equity by deploying more and more debt, right? Nowadays, if you see the startups company, right? I'm sure most of you might be watching Shark Tank these days, right? So you are being now more familiar to ever before in the ecosystem of the startup. And you might be saying like the startups are growing multifolds year over year, right? In that case of scenario, they would love to preserve their equity and utilize more and more debt. Why they preserve the equity? Because as the businesses go for expansion, the value of equity keep on increasing at exponential rate, right? Make sense? Yes, so clear. Next one is profitability. The firm with high profitability are better able to support more of their financing need with internal generated fund, right? If the company you know, is self-sustainable, then it is easy for that organization to naturally grow. But if the company is dependent on the external funds, so for example, if you see company like Baizu, Zomato, Swiggy, Oyo, all these companies are being very much dependent on the investor's fund to grow. Right, because all these companies are loss making organization. Right, so if the company to have good profitability, the firm with the high profitability are better able to support more of their financing need with the internally generated revenues. Make sense? Fifth point, clear everyone. Sixth point is taxes. The higher the firm's marginal tax rate, the greater the advantage of using debt. What does it mean? If the tax rate are high, that means you will take more and more tax benefit on interest, right? As you are taking more and more tax benefit of interest, so involving debt more and more will reduce your overall weighted average cost of capital. Right, and it will increase your debt compared to equity. Make sense? Last one is management attitude. Management are exercise judgment as to appropriate capital structure is used. You know, some management are conservative, right? They are not comfortable using more debt, rather they use more of equity. But some companies' management are more aggressive. They believe in using more and more debt and saving their equity because equity has the highest valuation, right? So it depends on the attitude of management. Make sense? Yes, yeah, so any doubt so far? No, so clear. Hmm? Okay, so let's do a to practice question. So first one is code well. Code well is using a constant growth dividend discount model. That means dividend discount model to forecast the value of share of common stock. Inherit, inherited in Codewell assumption is the idea that the stock price will grow at the same amount as the dividend. Second is compounding growth is linear. Third is dividend will grow at a rate faster than their presumed presume dividend rate. Fourth is stock price will grow at the same rate of dividend. 
So which option is the correct option? Sir, linear mean? Linear mean like same, right? Compounding root is linear. Hmm? Arun, are you? Sir, constant growth or the same is the same. Compounding growth means growing year over year. So, what we have studied in dividend growth model? Dividend growth model is a method of valuing the price of company stock based on the fact that stock is worth the sum of all future dividend and discounted present value. And we have discussed the dividend growth will be constant year over year. It means same stock price in the current plotting. Dividend growth is constant rate. Right? Yes. So which option is correct here? First, First one. Stock price will grow at the same amount as the dividend. Right, everyone? Okay. Second question is, a company entered into an agreement with the firm who will factor the company's account receivable. So what is factoring? Any idea? Any idea what is factoring is all about? Hmm? Segregation. No. Factoring means when you have account receivable, that means you have amount due from third party. Right? So, rather than investing your time and energy on collection, most of the company, what they do, they give their account receivable to the banking company or NBFC company or other financial institution for factoring purpose. That means they will take care of the recovery and they will provide you cash immediately after some discount. For example, if you have $1 million account receivable, right? you can go to the bank, financial institution or other financial institution who, do fact who provide factoring service. So they may give you the cash immediately, maybe at 5% discount, 6% discount, or 7% discount. That is called factoring and cashing your account receivable at the discount immediately to meet your cash need, right? The factor agree to buy the company receivable, which average 100,000 per month and have average collection period of 30 day. The factor will advance up to 80% of the face value of receivable at annual rate of 10% and charge a fee of 2% on all receivable purchase. Right? The controller of the company estimates that the company would save $18,000 in collection expense over the year. Fee and interest is not deducted in advance. Yeah, sorry, my internet got disconnected. Can you all hear me, Mac? Hello? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so there was internet drop. So, here, the call of the question is, you have $100,000 per month account receivable, which is 30-day due. That means credit period is 30-day. Hmm? And the factor will advance up to 80%. That means 80% of account receivable you'll be receiving in advance and 20% you will receive later on, right? And the annual rate of return is 10% and the fee the factor will be charging is 2% on account receivable, which, he, which factor is purchasing. So the question is, what is the annual cost of financing 140 percent 60 percent 17.5 percent 
or 24% and how? Any idea like how we need to do the calculation? Can I, let me open an Excel sheet. Yeah, so let's go back to the question. What they are saying, the average is 100,000 per month and have average collection period of 30 days and factor will advance up to 80% of the face value of receivable at the annual rate of 10% and charge a fee of 2% on all receivable purchase. That means 20% has been discount given, right? Sorry? So that means 20% discount has been given instantly, right? No. Uh, one second. One second. So the company entered into an arrangement with the firm uh, who will factor the account receivable. The factor agreed to buy the company receivable, which average 100,000 per month and have a collection period of 30 days. The factor will advance up to 80% of the fees value. So factor is advancing this and 2.8 80 percent of it advanced receivable at the annual rate of 10 percent so it's charging this into 0.1 10 percent uh, of the face value of uh, 10 percent and he's charging a fees of two percent on all receivable two percent on all receivable so your total receivable into 0 0.02. So 2000 will be on that, right? So he's charging 2% on all receivable purchase. Sorry, purchase is 8,000 into 0.02. So your cost is So the controller of the company estimated that the company would save 18,000 in collection expense over the year. So this is your monthly expenses. This into one, two. This is your annual expense and the saving is 18,000. So your total expense is 97,000 and Total of this is so uh, your average is Mm -hmm. Ideally, it has to be 20%. And uh, if we say this is not saving, so yeah, it's 24%. So this one, fourth option is correct. So how we have done, how we need to do the math. So total receivable, monthly receivable is $100,000. Okay. Right? Are you guys with me? Yes, mm -hmm. Out of that, 80% they are factoring. That means factoring is $80,000 per month. Yes, right? And those 80000 they are paying interest of 10%. Right? That is 8000 Plus, they are paying 2% processing fees. So, total amount they are paying is 9600 Right? 
multiply by 12. That means for entire year, it is 115,200, right? 115,200 is the total expense which they are incurring on how much? That is, if you take average of the receivable, this divided by 2. So, on, this will be 115 divided by 480. So, this is 24%. Right? This is how this calculation you need to make. And 24% is right answer. Right? Clear? So, last time, 18,000. Hmm. So, till here it is clear. 9600 yes, divided by 12 and mm -hmm. then the uh, denominator will be average because it is month end so you'll be taking monthly average so hence you need to divide by 2 uh, can you explain me the calculation of 8000 yeah so this 8000 is 10 percent of 80000 okay and then 2% of 80,000 is processing fees. So the total is 9,600 multiplied by 12 is 115,200. And the average receivable is 960 divided by 2. And 24% is 115,200 divided by 480. So 960 would be given in the question. Which one? Nine nine lakh sixty thousand. No, it is eighty thousand multiplied by twelve. Okay. Hmm? So okay. we have taken average of that is divided by two. Uh so excluding the ten percent that they are charging annually, uh we have to pay two th uh two percent extra. Over and above, yes. That's a processing fees. Okay. And ten percent is what charges? Interest. Okay. Interest. Okay. Okay. Understood. Right, so fourth option is correct. So point one two are for B. Point one two means twenty four is on. No, sir. One double one five two double zero divided by four eighty. Hmm. One second. Earlier, you did some sort of calculation where you got 20%, right? Say that again. Earlier, you calculated something and you got 20%, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, at that, that time, I have not included this processing fees of oh. 1600. Oh, okay. Right, Kashish? Sorry, 480 over 960. That's oh, average. Average. Because like, uh, you know, like when you are taking cost of data, it is always average. Because debtors are throughout the period, not at one particular period. No, for, for example, like your sales transaction you are making every day. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that case of scenario, we generally take average. Okay. Right. So that is the reason like it's divided by two. If you remember like uh, data turnover ratio also, there also you will take opening plus closing divided by two. So average. Okay. okay. Right? Because okay. why we take average? Every day you are making transaction and it is resulting some you are getting money, some you are paying money, uh, some you are expecting to recover. Okay. Okay. Take it. Hmm? Got it. Uh, your question may he estimate uh, that the company would save 18,000 in collection, right? Mm -hmm. Uska calculation nahi hoga kya? Haan, that is basically uh, distractor information. Achha, okay. Hmm. So they give you a lot of distractor information in complex questions. Okay. Right. So uh, we are done with 2.2.2. So now we are jumping onto the new topic, which is investment alternative using financial valuation decision model. 
right? So in this financial valuation decision model or investment alternative, we'll be understanding five things. First one is valuation fundamental, that is fair value basics. And then after we'll be understanding the approaches to determine the fair value. And then after we'll be understanding in detail about the fair value hierarchy, that is level one, level two, level three in detail. And then lastly, we'll be understanding disclosure part of it. First, we'll be understanding in detail about all the fundamental of valuation. Then after second thing we'll be understanding is the valuation assumption. So which are very important. So any valuation which you will be doing, there would be certain significant assumption you might be making it. So those assumption are being used differently in the different approaches. So for that, first we'll be understanding all the three, four category of approaches. So approaches include your cost approach, your market approach, your income approach, and other relevant approach and assumption. So for the respective approach, there would be respective assumption we'll be understanding in detail, right? Then after we'll be understanding the valuation methods, which is most prominently used is the black skull model method and two methods which we have discussed above, that is capital asset pricing model or discounted growth model. So second and third capital asset pricing model and discounted uh, dividend growth model we have already studied above. So here we'll be discussing in detail about the black skull model. So what I have experienced in CPA, they will not give you like complete question to calculate black skull model or maybe kappa model or discounted growth model but they will give you like this much is the uh, this valuation method has been used or this much is the value based on this valuation method because generally valuation questions come in the actuarial examination the cp examination it is not heavily tested right the fourth one is assets and investment management so that we'll be discussing what is asset management, what is investment management, what is portfolio management, and what is the process of investment. So that probably will be covering tomorrow. Then lastly is the capital budgeting. So in the capital budgeting, we'll be understanding fundamental of capital budgeting, time value of money, hope you remember, present value right from your school days, payback method. I know some of you might have studied costing in your college days or in, in your masters. So these most of these concepts are coming from there. Or uh, strategic financial management, if you might have studied in your college day or maybe in your professional qualification. So these all topics are coming directly from there. So we'll be understanding payback method, discount, discounted payback, which is an advanced level of payback method. Then after accounting rate of returns, net present value methods, internal rate of return method, and profitability index, which is PV index method. And the last one is cost variable pricing analysis, or you can say margin of safety analysis. So this asset and investment management or capital budgeting will be covering tomorrow. Today, we'll take a target to complete the valuation fundamental, valuation assumption, and valuation method. Already we have covered in valuation method, capital asset pricing model and the dividend discount growth model, right? This is what is in agenda for today and tomorrow. First, let's understand valuation fundamental. So this is 100% in line with the ASC 820, which you have studied in the FAR exam. Right. Some of you have already studied like FAR. So section uh, ASC 820, fair value measurement and disclosure, which we have discussed over there. So it's 100% same way we need to use here also. So what are things you need to keep in mind when you are calculating the fair value? So the first one is to determine the fair value of any asset, liability, equity ownership. The following items must taken into consideration. The very first thing is the age of the asset or the liability. Second is condition of the respective asset or liability, attribute of the respective asset or liability, 
ability of the valuation object to stand alone basis or need to function as a part of unit. That means that particular asset or liability, what is their ability to use for the valuation? For example, if you are doing business valuation and you have properties, plant and equipment, what is the capacity of their utilization and what is their maximum capacity at which they can do? So those all things are also being important when you do the fair value measurement of those respective assets. Next is location. So location is also very important. For example, you have a piece of land in a metro city, right? And the same piece of land, if you have in a village, county, or maybe tier three city, so will it be of same value? The answer is no, right? So the location is also matter when you do the calculation of fair value. Six is restriction placed on the use or sales. If the asset which you have in your hand, you can use it, but you cannot sell it. So have you heard about restricted assets by any chance? Have you guys heard this term restricted assets? Yes, no. Are you guys with me? Hmm? Have you heard this term? Restricted assets? Yes, sir. Hmm. What is that? Sir, basically restricted for any particular use. Hmm. Restricted because... for... No, restricted only for the particular purpose. Other than that, you cannot use it. Use it yes, sir. Right? For example, like if you see in India, we have like a lot of school, colleges, trust, hospital, right? They are generally made by NGOs, right? And those NGOs or trust cannot sell that respective land or the respective property because it is being, they have received it by the donation or they have received it from the government for the particular purpose only, right? So hence they cannot use that property, that piece of land for any other purpose for which they have received from the government or from any individual as a donation, right? Same way, you know, like uh, we all, maybe most of you might have taken home loan, right? So when you take the home loan, you'll take, you'll give them the, your property paper to the bank and bank put lien on the property. That means unless and until you relieve, you repay the bank loan, you cannot sell that property, right? Make sense? So those things are called restriction to use or sale. Next one is principal market. Any doubt on restriction? So far so good? Yes, sir. Hmm. The next one is principal market. So principal market is a market for assets and liability that has greatest volume and the level of activity. So principal market is basically the market for any particular product or service which you have for your organization or maybe the security which you have for investment purpose in which stock in which you can say exchange it is being trading more that exchange is called the principal marketplace for the stock or for in case of inventory the market in which most of the trade do happen for the respective category of item is called principal market Second concept you need to understand is the most advantageous market. So most advantageous market is that market where you maximize the amount that would be received for an asset or paid to transfer the liability after the transportation and transaction cost. That means, for example, if you have, let's assume the share of Tesla, right? The share of Tesla is already being listed on NASDAQ 
and it may be listed on any other stock exchange also, right? On which stock exchange it is listed at better price where you can release them, where you can sell them. So that is market is called most advantageous market. For example, you have any product which you are selling. If you are selling that product in the local market, you may receive, let's assume, $100. But if you export them, then you receive $200, right? So which market for you is most advantageous market? Export market or local market? Hmm? What is most advantageous market? Export market or local market? Export. Right? Export market because there we are getting the maximum revenue. Right? So what is the difference between principal market or most advantageous market? What is principal market? Hmm? We have just discussed. For which has the greatest volume. Yeah. So the market where most of the trade do happen for respective category of asset, inventory or investment. And what is most advantageous market where you receive best of the best return. Make sense? Yes. Sir. Ninth one is market participants. So market participants are buyers and sellers, right? That would include the buyer and seller are not related party. That means they are independent. Right? Second is both parties are knowledgeable about the item being transferred and have access to usual and customary information. That means one thing is the buyer and seller, they are not related party. And the second important thing, they understand the market scenario and they are, they are knowledgeable buyer or seller who understand the market condition and the customary business practice for the respective item. Third is both the party have ability to complete the transaction. That means none of them is minor None of them is unsound mind. None of them is bankrupt who cannot do the transaction. Right? So both the party are major party and both the party are sound mind and not the bankrupt. Hence, they both can do the transaction. The last one is both the party are willing to complete the transaction but are not being forced to do so. Right? Both the party has willingness to do the transaction, but there is no undue influence. What is undue influence? Any idea? Anyone can explain? What is undue influence? Have you guys heard this term before? Yes, sir. Hmm. Sir, which yeah. doesn't have any impact on it. Mm -hmm. No. Manish, Matthew, Harini, Arun, any idea what is undue influence? No, I haven't heard. Sorry? I haven't heard of it. Okay. So undue influence means any person who is influencing to take the decision unduly. That is called undue influence. Maybe, you know, like if parents ask something to their kids to do, so they are in influential position, right? Employer ask anything to employee to do, they are generally in influential position, right? If any government officer ask any servant to do any activity, so he or she is in influential position, right? Or if somebody ask you to do something on gunpoint, that means you are under influence of threat of your life. So that is called undue influence. That means you are in some influence when you have taken the decision. Make sense? Yeah. So what is the D point here? Both the party are 
willing to complete the transaction but are not forced to do so. Clear? Yes. Hmm. So that is about market participant. Really quick, just refresh what all things we have discussed. Valuation fundamental. You need to understand the age of the asset, condition of the asset, attribute of the assets, ability for the valuation, restriction if there is any place, market, uh, principal market, most advantageous market, and the market participant. Those definitions we understood. Now, let's jump into the approaches. Approaches to determine fair market value. Right. So, we have studied so far fair value basic. Now, we are at approaches to determine fair market value. This and this topic are clubbed together. We'll be, we'll be studying together. So, approaches and the assumption to the approaches, we covering both the topics together. Okay? Or do you want to take some break? If you are feeling drowsy? Yes? No? Yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay, so it's 12.15. Maybe at 12.45 we can come back. Okay, hmm? okay let's come back at 12.45.